on finishing and running well. Are you in a race of faith? Yes. Were you put in that race the day that you were redeemed and born again? Yes. That's the day you were put in it, even though some of us may have not realized, oh, I'm in a race now, you know, and I have a purpose. So some of us just thought, I'm born again. Well, we were put in a race. And so we are looking at lessons this year to help us to focus on finishing well. So we can say with Paul, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. And it's all to the praise and glory of Jesus Christ, because it's his life living in me and working in me that will permit me and enable me to be able to finish well. Today we're looking at warning two. Remember we started warning one last week in the book of Hebrews. Today is warning two, and we're going from drifting to doubting. Very quickly, if you start drifting, you'll be doubting God's word. Now, if you remember, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews was written to Jewish believers, right? We established that firmly last week. They had trusted Jesus Christ. They said, he is our Messiah. And they were coming out of the Jewish religion and out of the temple worship, you know, slaughtering the lambs and the sacrifices, etc. But they have been, they trusted Jesus Christ for their salvation. And the author of Hebrews is going to give some warnings now because what do they want to do? They want to go back and put themselves under the Jewish religion. And he's going to give them five warnings of why they should not do that. Now, what was their problem? Fear because of persecution. Persecution is rising. Persecution is increasing. And so they all come up with the solution. We want to escape persecution, and here is how we're going to do it. We are going to turn from what we once believed. You depart from a belief that you formerly held, and they are going to go back to the temple. They're going to depart from the faith, go back to the temple, and get a lamb and slay the lamb and participate in the sacrifices. He says, don't do it. You cannot do that. Now, in warning number two, we're going to see this covers from Hebrews 3, 7 to chapter 4, verse 16. And the theme kind of in this section is God is greater in the rest that he will give you. And we're going into the danger of doubting and not entering his rest. And we're going to define that so we know what it is. And if you start doubting, you're going to develop a hard heart. So I'm, I've got five warnings, and they're going to get increase. They're going to increase in intensity, and the consequences. Number one, I just started drifting, and already at number two, if I start drifting, I'm going to be doubting God's word, and I'm going to develop a hard heart. And I've got three more to go. So we see the seriousness of drifting, right? We don't even want to start drifting. Now the author of Hebrews is going to use examples from Old Testament. Now, we have some uh, preachers in the United States that are saying we don't need to pay any attention to the Old Testament. Well, I, they need to read 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 10, and they need to read Romans 15, 4, because Paul is very clear that we use the Old Testament, especially the Israelites, their history, how God dealt with them, and we learn it was all written for us, right? And we are supposed to learn. So we're looking at the Israelites once again, and most of us can identify with them. We're looking at the, at the Israelites, and they have been, uh, they're concerned about they're going to lose their inheritance. And so we're going to look at this Exodus generation that comes out of Egyptian bondage. Who brought them out? God brought them out. And so we want to focus on this group. You and I, you're going to go back with me in history now. We are in Egypt. We are of the nation of Israel. And it's Exodus 12. And God has given Moses some new instructions. We've been held in bondage, right? And the Pharaoh would not let us go. But now in chapter 12, verse 2, the month is Nisan. Now it's important that, it, he, that he tells us that Nisan was month number seven before this time. 
God's giving them a new calendar. This is God's purpose, God's calendar. So he's changing what was number seven is now going to become number one because this is going to be your redemption and this is going to start a new life for you. So if we notice, he says, this month is now going to be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. That's why the Jewish people have two calendars. Were you aware of that? They have one that they call their religious calendar, and it does start in the month of Nisan, and they call that month one. But when they get to month number seven, which is Tishri, they say, well, that's our civil calendar, and they call that their new year, which is around September. But God said, no, this is to be the beginning of your year now, and he changed their calendar. In the Old Testament, you will see it called a bib or a, or a viv, and it means barley is ready. The barley is ripe. And why is he doing this? Because in this season, in the month of Nisan, what grain is coming in to, uh, to be uh, harvested? Barley. Why is that significant? Because Jesus is going to be crucified on the 14th day of Nisan. And then on the 17th day, what's going to happen? He's going to rise. And what was the priest doing in the temple? He's waving the first sheaf of barley. This is the barley harvest. And he raised the first fruits. Remember, they would go out in the field and say, we need some barley that's ready to be harvested. And then the priest would wave it on Resurrection Sunday. And so that was the first fruits of the barley harvest was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, it is not called Nisan until they go to Babylon. So we call it Nisan, which is more familiar to us, but Nisan really was the Babylonian name. Okay, y'all with me so far? I hope so. We're only a few slides in. Now, he says, speak unto this whole congregation of Israel and tell them, on the 10th day of this month, which is Nisan, this is now our first month, on the 10th day, you're going to go out and find a little lamb. And that lamb, you've got to make sure it's a year old, right? And it has to have no blemish. So you're going to go out and you're going to choose a little lamb for your family. And you're going to keep this little lamb. Can you imagine the children in the house after they've had this little lamb for four days? What do, what do they do with a puppy? You know, and with a lamb. And he said, then you're going to keep it. You're going to be observing it, and it becomes almost like a pet for four days. And then on the 14th day of the month, what am I going to do with my lamb? You're going to have to kill it. You're going to have to slit its throat and shed its blood. And he says, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, what were the instructions that they were to do because redemption is coming? This is the day they're going to be redeemed. Exodus 12, 7, moreover, they're supposed to take the blood of their lamb that they chose. Was this a substitutionary sacrifice? Yes, we all understand that. And now they take the branches of hyssop and they are going to dip it in the blood of the lamb that they have slain and put it on the doors and lintels of their houses. Now, when the death angel would come, if he saw the blood, he passed over them, right? And that was for their protection. Now, this is a picture of the day when a man enters peace with God. That when you're redeemed, are you reconciled to God? And you now have peace with God. Did you come on his terms? Yes. So were they doing exactly what God told Moses to tell them? Do you think some of them might have been wondering, why are we doing this? But don't you see they were obedient, right? This is their day of redemption. Now, let's, I want to look at the instructions because they're just very interesting. And let's look at God's instructions. How am I going to celebrate Passover? Passover is the day of redemption. Y'all have that? It's the day I'm going to be redeemed. And here's my instructions. Exodus 12, verse 11. You're going to eat it in this manner. Your loins are going to be girded. Remember those robes they, and they had to put them up and gird them around? Your sandals are on your feet. Your staff is in your hand, and you're going to eat it in haste. This is the Lord's Passover. So am I to eat it with these instructions? Yes. yes. And then 
Feast of Unleavened Bread would start at 6 o'clock that night, and they were supposed to start eating it, and he told them to eat the whole lamb. You feed on the word of God. All right? So this is their instructions. The day the blood was applied on their doorpost, they were be, to be equipped. I'm taking you out of here. I'm taking you out of bondage. I'm delivering you, and you need to be equipped for a journey. Your loins are girded. You have your shoes on your feet. You have your staff in your hand, and you have eaten, and you're going to be ready to go. Right? We're going on a journey. Can you imagine? Where are we going? I don't know, but you're supposed to be ready. All right? Now, he says, this day was to be the beginning of a journey, and God in Deuteronomy 6.23 said, I brought you out so I could take you in to your inheritance, your promised land, that land that he promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the land flowing with milk and honey. So did he have a purpose for redeeming them? Yes, because he's going to take them over here and put them in their inheritance, the promised land. And he said he would take them in and give them victory, correct? Yes. All right. So we've got it. We're going to start this journey and we're going to our promised land, our inheritance. And from this day, you can never be the same again. You will not be the same again. And now we're going to embark on the journey. Did they start the journey that night? Yes. They started that night. Now, Moses in Exodus 13, 3, here's what he told the people. Remember this day. The day of what? My redemption. The day we celebrated Passover. The day God brought me out of bondage. This is the day of our salvation, correct? For you and me. Remember the day that you came out from Egypt. You were out from the house of bondage. Had they been under Pharaoh... Do you remember Pharaoh was a type of Satan who held him in bondage? What did he say over and over? I will not let you go. I will not let you go. He said it so many times, and finally he said, you can go. But did he change his mind? Yes. Yeah, because he sent the enemy soldiers, his, all of his army, after them. But Moses said, remember the day that you were born again. Remember this day. Y'all have that? Yes. Remember the day. That I brought you out of bondage. He said, for by the strength of the hand of God Almighty, he's the one that brought you out of this place. Don't forget it. He brought you out. He goes on to say, and this is very important, it shall be when the Lord himself brings you into your land, that inheritance, the land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey, the promised land, it's all the same, right? When the Lord is the one that brings you in, he's the one that swore unto your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, does that not sound wonderful? Yes. You will keep this service. What service? Passover. Passover. You will keep Passover in this month. What month? Nisan, the first month. And they will keep it on the 14th day Every year, it was to be a perpetual remembrance. I'm celebrating the day God brought me out of bondage. I'm celebrating my redemption. Okay? Now, y'all need to stay with me because this is going to come to a wonderful conclusion. Now, he said, this is real important. This is a day. This day of your redemption is to be remembered when? When you're in the land and you're possessing it. I'm going to remember my day of redemption. God brought me out. And when I get over here in my inheritance, my abundant life, that's a picture of Canaan for you and me. When I get over here, then I celebrate. And it's a day to be remembered. He brought me out. He's going to bring me in to my inheritance, my promised land. Now, they had a physical land to possess, right? It is a picture of of you and I possessing the spiritual inheritance we have in Jesus Christ right now. He said, I came to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. So we can have life, but not everyone reaches the abundant life. And so he also is going to take us into that. And this, we're supposed to celebrate our redemption in the land to be possessed. Now let's notice. Very important. 
God will allow them to celebrate Passover only one time after they leave Egypt. Remember, he brought them through the Red Sea. And then after they went to the Red Sea, they went to Mount Sinai, remember? And in Exodus 19, God told them, I brought you out to bring you here to me. Because I want to make you a treasured possession. I want you to be a kingdom of priests. I want you to be everything, my special people. If you will obey my commandments, then that will come to pass. Remember that? And so they're leaving Sinai. They were there about a year, correct? And he, they made their covenant with him. And they said, we will and we do. We will obey. And then what happened? He taught them all about the tabernacle. They built the tabernacle. He taught them all about the sacrifices. And now a year later, he tells Moses, let them celebrate. We're now in the first month of the second year. And they're going to celebrate Passover. Because it's the day that they were redeemed. Okay? But that's the only time they will now get to celebrate it until they get in the land with Joshua. So for about 40 years, they will never get to celebrate it again. Why? It's a day to be remembered in the land when you possess it. You know, God really convicted me a lot through this lesson. I don't know how many times when I was struggling in the wilderness, trying to be like Jesus, trying to live the Christian life, that I partook of the Lord's Supper, and I was not in the land, in the abundant life. I believe there's many times that we partake of the Lord's Supper when we probably need to get our heart right before we take it. Now, the Lord spoke unto Moses. He's in the wilderness of Sinai. It's the first month of the second year that they've come out of Egypt, so we're about a year later. He said, let the children of Israel this time keep the Passover at the appointed season. Do all of God's feast and uh, sacrifices have an appointed time? Yes. yes. And so this 14th day. Now let's look at these people. Let's look at their life in the past year. They're getting ready to leave Sinai. Were they a redeemed people delivered by the power of God? Yes. All right. It says in Exodus 14, 31. Now I'm trying to make a point that they were redeemed because you have some commentators that will say they were not because of their struggle in the wilderness. So we're, we're going to try to address all that today. In Exodus 14, 31, it says, Israel saw the great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, right? Did they see all the plagues? It says the people feared the Lord, and they believed the Lord and his servant Moses. But here's the, the verse that really jumped out at me, Exodus 15, 13. He said, this was their song of deliverance, the song of Moses. Thou in thy mercy has led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Did Moses say that God had redeemed them and they were a redeemed people? Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Did they see the mighty power of God working in their midst? Were they redeemed by the blood of the Passover lamb? Did they do what they were told to do in obedience and putting it over the uh, doorpost of their home, their dwelling? They were delivered out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. Did they see the enemy drown? When they got on the other side, God said, look back. You see those, that enemy? You will never see him again. That's significant. You will never see him again. Were they fed manna from heaven daily? Were they a witness of the goodness of Canaan that God promised to them? Think of when the spies came back. Remember they brought, the grapes were so big it took two men to carry them. So did they witness what the land was going to be like? Yes. Now, they were witnesses of the goodness and the glory of their almighty God. But they failed to heed God's instruction. And now they're going to be judged and disciplined for their disobedience. 
what had been God's command when he took them to the land that he promised them. He said, I will be your God. I will dwell among you. Yes, there's enemies in there, but I will fight your battles and you will have victory. And he said, enter it and claim it. And they said, no. Now, was it God's purpose? If we look at his purpose, was, it was not God's will for Israel to remain in Egypt, correct? He's not willing that any should perish. Is he willing that all come to salvation? Did, was it his will for them to remain in the wilderness? <laughs> no. What was his desire? It should have been an 11-day journey. I'm taking you out of bondage. I've taught you everything. I've been among you. You've seen all my works. And we're going to go over here about 11-day journey. And I want you to enter in and I want you to claim. That's what he told them. Now, possession or ownership of the land of Canaan, was it an inheritance? Yes, because that was promised. He, uh, Abraham was told, this will be an inheritance for your descendants. Did Abraham ever live in it? He wandered around, right? God showed it to him. But then Abraham went to Egypt, remember? Okay, so it's an inheritance, and he promised it for obedience. This is like a reward for faithfulness. Do y'all see that? Okay. I want you to remember, Canaan is not heaven. Okay. Because some of your old songs talk about going to the land of Canaan, heaven. No, it's not. Canaan is full of enemies and battles and bloodshed. <laughs> now, when Israel got to the border of their inheritance, they delayed they stop. Can you imagine that 11-day journey? Can you imagine how excited they must have been? We're going to our inheritance. We're out of Egypt, and God has shown himself to us, and we're getting ready to live in our inheritance, that promised land, that land flowing with milk and honey. It's just wonderful. God's promised it to us. Can you imagine the excitement, the adrenaline going those 11 days till they hear the report of the 10 bad spies, or the bad report? Now, they delay because they doubt the promise of God. So what's happened? Just like in our first warning. Our first warning was do not drift from what you know about God's word, his promises, and what he said. If I start drifting from the promises and what God has told me he will do, and I'm not standing on it, I'm not staying with my anchor, and I start drifting from those truths, before you know it, I'm doubting. And it says, I will develop a hard heart. Well, let's follow them through the wilderness. Remember our first warning. Therefore, he says in Hebrews 2 verse 1, Therefore, we have to give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. Remember in chapter 1, we heard about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He's greater than the angels. He has this inheritance that God is going to give him. He's going to have his own kingdom and he's going to rule the world. Y'all remember that? And, and uh, the author of Hebrews says in chapter 2, verse 1, don't forget it. Keep your eyes focused on the truth of God's word and what you know about Jesus Christ, lest you start drifting away. So if I start drifting away from what God says in his word, this is sitting on the shelf getting dusty, just like in the picture. Am I neglecting the word and the word's not doing its work in me? And the longer I stay away and drift away from everything God says in this book, I'm going to begin doubting, especially when persecution arises. I begin doubting. And then what happens to my faith? My faith begins to waver, like James talks about. Now, this is so interesting. They took their first wavering step of doubt when they said, Moses, uh, could we get some spies and go in and check that out? Remember? I'm showing I'm doubting already, and I'm wavering. I want to make sure it's everything God said it would be. So they go in, and they search out the land. And you know what happens. We want to make sure it's everything God said before we agree to go in there and engage in any battle. So this was their first step. Now, the spies traveled 500 miles up in there. Well, that'd be round trip, 40 days. 
but they discovered nothing that God had not already told them. And they brought back the evidence of the, the, the size of the grapes and the produce and etc. And the, even the ten spies, remember, they said it's everything God said it would be, but there's all these big giants in there. So what happened? We see on the left side of the screen, the people that were doubting, they began to think. They thought they see themselves as a little grasshopper. They don't look at all the good stuff. They look at the giants. And that's what they see, and it fear rises up, right? And then they refused to go in. They disobeyed, and they doubted, whereas uh, Joshua and Caleb, they see a great God who can take care of the giant. He can take care of devastating circumstances in our life. He can keep fear from rising up in us, even when things look bleak. So they begin. They're getting ready to maybe go in, and all of a sudden, they're not walking by faith any longer. They're walking by sight because all I see is those giants. That's all they see are the giants that are in the land. And now, if you are not going forward in your faith and maturing, what's going to happen? You're going to go backward. Because can you stand still? No, you cannot be stagnant. Now, let's look at this. Israel did not lose their status as a redeemed people. He said they were redeemed and they had applied the blood. So my question is, can they return to Egypt and be unredeemed? <laughs> no. Because God even said, you are not allowed to go back to Egypt. You're not allowed to be back under bondage and slavery. And God told them, you cannot go back. When they wanted to go back, God said, you cannot go back. You'll die here in the wilderness. Now, nevertheless, did they ever reach the blessing of the inheritance in what God had for them? They never even tasted of it. Not one taste of their inheritance in their promised land did they ever receive. Now, if you look up at my map, okay, on the left side, do you see the red arrow? The bottom of the red arrow indicates the location of Kadesh Barnea. So that's where they were when all this happened. Do you see the red arrow goes up just a little bit? And I'm already in the promised land. They could have walked right in. If they had been obedient, they could have just walked right in. God said, I will fight your battles and you will have victory. You just follow me, let me lead. That's how close they were to just walking into it. Now, if you look at my map now, on the far left, do you see a black arrow kind of shaded in red? That's where we just were. Kadesh Barnea, and I could have gone straight up into my promised land. Do you see the green circle? No, I'm going to wander around for 38 more years in the wilderness. Do you see the red arrow on the right? Yes. So after 38 years, if, uh, we did a lesson on this last year. God said, turn north. And so they, they came up and they came north. And now they're going to have to make this decision that they've got to cross the Jordan River this time. Whoa, I should have gone back in when I could have walked in. No, they're going to have to come up on the right side, on the east side of the river, and to get their inheritance, they're going to have to make an intentional decision and cross that Jordan River. Now, what's wrong with the Jordan River? It's barley season. During barley season, so it's the month of Nisan, because when they get in the land, they're going to celebrate Passover. So on day 10 which is significance that the day they chose the lamb. On day 10, they are going to start their journey across the Jordan River. And on day 14, he's going to allow them to have Passover once again because now they're in the land possessing. Do y'all see how that, all that worked? Now, this is a new generation that's going in to possess the land and enter their inheritance. Remember, Joshua gave them all the instructions, and they said, we're with you. We're going. That Jordan River... It was out of its banks, it had roaring rapids, and it was more than a mile wide instead of 30 yards. It was a significant river to cross. Now, remember the Red Sea? God parted the waters and gave them the dry land without them having to do anything, but Moses raised his rod, right? Okay, now he's going to require a step of faith. You want that inheritance, which to us is the abundant life? You want it? 
He said, you are going to have to take a step of faith. And you are going to step out. You see the Ark of the Covenant in blue in the upper right? The Ark of the Covenant, that's God's presence. He will go before you. He's behind you. Will he be fighting for you? Will he give me victory in this land, even through my circumstances and battles, things I need to overcome, like my fear, my anxiety, my jealousy, my envy, my critical spirit, my critical tongue? Can he give me victory over all that? Yes. That's where we get victory. But they had to make an intentional decision here and cross the river by faith. I believe it is a picture of a believer who, like me, came to a point in my life after kind of struggling in the wilderness for a while, you agree I will die to self. I am in absolute surrender to you. I am tired of trying to live this life on my own without the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, can people have the power of the Holy Spirit and the life of Jesus in them, but they aren't appropriating it in their life? Yes? Oh, we're going to, well, we'll look at it. If y'all, y'all sound a little hesitant. We'll see. Okay. They're going to claim their inheritance by faith. This Canaan represents the spiritual inheritance that I have. It's like my abundant life in Christ. It's like that abundant life that you and I have in Christ. Now, what are these people doing out in the wilderness? What does that signify to us? This is an experience of a believer who will not claim their spiritual inheritance in Christ. They will, they just doubt God's word. God, you don't know the situation that's in my life. You don't know. But this is how we talk and we think. Something devastating comes into our life. And I think, God, you just don't understand this when I think I'm going to have to take care of it. I don't know that you can give me victory over this. And we sit and we stew and the fear rises up and we're anxious and we go into depression. Why? Because I am not taking advantage of what is already mine. And that's what they wouldn't do. It's already theirs. God had given it. But they wouldn't go in and claim it. That's like years when I had, let me think of an example. There are many. Okay, I had, I had a miscarriage uh, in 1980. And I was five months along. And so after uh, I lost that baby boy, then I went home and I was really struggling. Now, you remember all this time I'm down at the church. Okay. I'm struggling. Why? Because thoughts come into my mind like, I, I guess God doesn't think I'm a good enough mother. He can't trust me with a child. I mean, all these thoughts went through my mind. And this was about the time abortion was becoming big in the United States. And on the TV, they were showing barrels of aborted babies. And I would just sit and sob because I wanted mine and lost it. You know, so all these things going through my mind. And uh, in uh, 1997, I think it was, Laura was the victim of a sexual crime. And uh, she went in a downward spiral. This is part of the story y'all don't know so much about. We had to take her to a home and put her in a uh, trauma uh, home for uh, grief and trauma. And we left her on Father's Day when she was 17 years old because she had gotten into Satanism and was doing stuff I don't even want to talk about. And so the struggle with her had been since she was about 16 years old. We went through a lot that is not even in the book. You know, so there was a lot before that. And so, you know, I would sit there and I would think, Paul and I are down at the church all the time. You know, we've raised our kids in Christian school. Why is this happening to Laura? You know, and she just became violent against God in the Bible. Where was God when I needed him? You know, so we went through a lot of all of that. And during that time, the the anxiety in me, I was put on a heart monitor. They thought I was having heart attacks, and I wasn't. It's just stress and anxiety. Where could I have found victory? It was there all the time. It was there all the time. But I struggled for several years, feeling like I wasn't a good enough mother. What have I done that could have caused all this? I went through a lot of grief as a mother, you know, and thinking that I had failed and all of those things. When Everything I needed was in Jesus over here. And I was in the wilderness. I wasn't claiming everything that was already mine. Did I have the life of Jesus in me? 
Yes, and I was sealed by the Holy Spirit, but I wasn't appropriating it in my life. So that's people in the wilderness. Now, was God with them? Oh, I'm going to show you how he was with them. It's just wonderful. As he was with Israel, but they do not enjoy the fullness of God's blessing. Many people are out of Egypt, but they never get in Canaan. We have defeated Christians all around us. Now, we're finally to the scripture. Hebrews 3, verse 7 through 9. He says, wherefore, if you will hear his voice, God's voice, harden not your heart as they did in the day of provocation, in the temp day of temptation. Remember when they're grumbling out there and they want water and God told Moses to strike the rock. Okay, that's where we are. Your fathers tempted me, they proved me, and they saw my works for 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. Can you Understand that we can grieve the heart of God. And I said, they always err in their heart, make mistakes, and they don't even know my ways. You know, if we would get in the book, we would know his ways. So I swore in my wrath, God says, they shall not enter into my rest. Well, what does that mean? Let's see. In Deuteronomy 12, 9, it says... You have not yet come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. Is the rest associated with the inheritance? Yes. Look at Joshua 1 when Joshua is about ready to take them in. He says you're going to go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord your God is giving you rest and the land. So we have the rest inheritance and land are they coupled together yes. yes so it's virtually the same thing now in the old testament we have two rest in old testament history we need to understand them so we won't get confused there is one that is called god's sabbath rest and that's when he ceased from his creation activities now there is a rest that we are talking about today Israel's rest in Canaan, the promised land, and it's called their rest. So when God says, I'm grieved with them, they don't know my ways, and they will not enter my rest. That word in, the, in Strong's is 2663, cataposis, and it means the rest attained by settling in Canaan, resting in it, dwelling in it, making that your habitation. Okay. So what are we talking about? They will not enter my rest, the rest that he had for them in Canaan, their inheritance, that land. So God, for a believer's spiritual experience, let's look at us. God's Sabbath rest is a picture of our rest that we get when we come to salvation in Jesus Christ, our justification. The rest of Israel, the promised land, is a picture of our present rest as I now begin to claim my inheritance. Everything I have in Jesus I have everything, right? Everything I need. But I need to start claiming it and partaking of it. So God's Sabbath rest is my salvation rest. And everyone that has that, will they have eternal life and go to heaven? Yes. But Israel's rest, Canaan, is a submission. It's a submission rest. And this is where I really begin to have victory in my circumstances in Jesus Christ. This submission or sanctification rest... I quit striving in the power of my flesh to try to become godly. I want to be like Jesus, and I'm going to bite the bullet and love those people. <laughs> See, that's in my flesh. Now, in the spirit, the love of Jesus Christ has been shed abroad in my heart. And as I surrender to the Holy Spirit and I stay in his word, what happens? I'm loving people I didn't think I could. <laughs> right? Oh, some of y'all are learning to love me. <laughs> you didn't know you could. <laughs> okay. So here we are with Paul in Romans 7. This was his struggle. i doing things I don't want to do. That's when you're living in the flesh. And it doesn't have to be. <laughs> I'm doing things I don't want to do. That was Paul in the flesh trying to remember. And then he said, the things I want to do, I'm not doing them. 
You and I know that struggle. What is it? It is the flesh lusting against our spirit. But Paul goes on to say in Romans 8, you have freedom in Jesus Christ. He said, you've got power in you to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, and that power's in you. Can he help me overcome my envy and my jealousy? Can he help me overcome my fear? Yes, but I don't let him. Right? Okay, after Laura announced to us she was a transgender, that was a moment about, I don't know how many years ago now, 15 or 16, that was the moment that I went from the wilderness and absolute surrender. Trying to, have been trying to live this and control things and figure everything out. And God can bring you to something in your life and you say, I have no plan. I cannot deal with this. I can't fix her. I can't even fix myself. So that was that moment of absolute surrender for me. And even those of you that have been with me since the house, you know, and even after we came to the activities building, even in the midst of a pit, in a dark pit with Laura, God gave me a peace that I cannot even explain to you. But that's when you start living in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can have his victory over your circumstances. So that's what Paul's talking about. This is abiding in Christ. By the working of his spirit in us, we are able to some degree live a godly life. Now, we will not live a godly life 100% of the time. Not, we will not in this life. But you should notice in your life that you are sinning less and less as you stay in the word. And he is working on you and changing you. Circumstances come into your life, and you should notice I'm not falling apart. Because what do you do? You go here. This is where you go. This is where you'll get your strength and your comfort and your encouragement. This is what we call resting in him. This is our abundant life. Resting in him, abiding in him, and it's the key to fruitfulness. I love this slide. I've been thinking about printing it and framing it. This is the inheritance of Canaan. This is the land flowing with milk and honey. Where God works in us. He fights our battles. He gives us victory. He gives us peace. This is Israel's rest. This is our spiritual rest. Our abundant life. And he promises me that if I will walk in the spirit and yield to the spirit. I have a promise. I will not fulfill the lust of my flesh. What a promise. But how we, we tend to kind of put that over here when things come up in our life. No, we need, to, we need to go here and surrender. Father, I don't understand this circumstance. But I know as I yield to you, you will give me victory over it. And I will not have fear and anxiety and doubt. And he will give you a peace that passes all understanding. Now, even in the Old Testament, with this group of people, the issue wasn't their works. What was the issue with them? Their faith in God to do the work of what he said. That was the issue. Not them working. But do I have faith that God said will do what he said he would do? That was their unbelief. So think of this. Rest, going into rest, is not the ab absence of activity or work. You know, I'm not sitting out on the rocking chair in the front porch. It is the absence of trusting in my own strength and ability to do stuff. I rest in him and I rest in God's ability. Can he pull my prodigal out of a dark pit? He's the only one that can. So I have to rest in that. Can he work behind the scenes even though I don't know it? And I rest in that. Now, so God's Sabbath rest and the promised land rest are two rests that you're going to see in the book of Hebrews. And in verse 9 of chapter 4, there is a third rest. And it says there remains a rest for the people of God, the only place it's used. And it's Sabbatismos, and it is the keeping of a Sabbath, and this is our future rest in heaven. So chapter 4, verse 9, you need to make sure that rest is a different rest 
than the others that he's talking about in chapter 4. Now, what are the results of this group of people? They never get to enter Canaan. They don't get to taste their inheritance. They don't go to the promised land. They don't have that land of milk and honey. They have no inheritance and they have no rest. They're going to live their life until they die out in the wilderness. This generation where they saved and redeemed out of Egypt by God's grace, his power, his strong right arm, but they never would go enter into their promised land, their inheritance. So to the point here, a redeemed people can lose their blessings because it depends on me. How was I saved? By faith. How am I supposed to keep walking? By faith and not by sight. And when they saw the giants and wouldn't go in, they turned to walking by sight. I am to continue my life walking by faith. It's not enough just to be saved by grace through faith. Hebrews is going to tell us the just will. You're going to live by faith. You were saved by faith, and now you're going to live by faith. In Hebrews 3.12, he continues, Take heed, brethren. Is he talking to believers? Yes. Lest there be in any of you... Now, notice last week, sometimes he includes himself. We, us, our, but now he's saying in you. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. It sounds like he's talking to a lost person, right? Oh, y'all hang with me. An evil heart of unbelief because you're departing from the living God. Departing here in the Greek, they are standing off from a former belief. They stand off from what they formerly believed. Remember these Jewish people? They want to go back. They're departing from putting their faith and trust in recognizing Jesus is the Messiah. And they depart from that. Does it mean that if I abandon that faith, that I will be condemned forever? Now, we need to be very careful here because it doesn't seem to fit the context talking about this Old Testament group. Departing. The word here is used as apostasy in this particular verse, and it's only this time in Hebrews. No other time. So we have to keep in context. Now let's, let's dig into this. Israel departed from the living God. They departed from something they formerly believed by refusing God's will for their life. What did he say? I want to bring you out, and I want to take you in. They stubbornly wanted to go their own way, and they wanted to go back to Egypt. Y'all with me? Now, did God allow them to go back to Egypt and be under bondage? He said, no, you're not going. Rather, he made them stay in the wilderness, and he's going to discipline them severely. And he said, you can't go back to Egypt, you can't go back to bondage, but you're not going to have your inheritance. You will not have your inheritance. I won't allow you to go in. Now, in verse 13, notice this for you and me. If we see someone drifting, are we to be a body that encourages one another? Okay, somebody has something coming up in their life, and maybe you see them wavering. Maybe you see them struggling. Are we to come alongside them? Yes, it says exhort one another daily. You need someone in your life exhorting you, and you need to exhort people. You encourage people. Come alongside people that may be drifting. Things come into their life, and they feel like they're going to fall apart. We've all been there, right? Right? Yes. While it is still called today, lest any of you, he didn't put himself in there, you would become hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, that's what happens to people when things come into their life. They start drifting and wavering a little bit. Can they suddenly be in hardness of heart? Yes. Now, hardness of heart, he said, through the deceitfulness of sin. This leads us, he says, to appetites that I should not have because they will compete with my affection for Jesus Christ. What are some of these? They, did they have cravings out in the wilderness? Yes. yes. Can we crave things that get us off of our affection for Jesus Christ? Their goals. They had a different goal. They had ambitions. 
Many of us can have goals and ambitions for our life, what we want to do with our life. And God says, this is my plan for your life. And we are to be obedient and follow that. So you can become hardened through deceitfulness of sin that it gets you off on the wrong track. And some of the tracks, they're not bad. They're just not what God wants you to be doing. Now he said, for we, now he puts himself back in. You are a partaker of Jesus Christ. You're a partaker of him if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast into the end. I need to stay anchored to him, correct? And he's the only one, just like our slide at the very beginning, for me to finish well, I must stay anchored to him because he's the only one that will enable me to finish well. He says, while it is said, today if you will hear his voice, don't harden your hearts like they did out there in the wilderness in the provocation. Now, what happened when they hardened their heart and they refused to go in? Penalty flags were thrown everywhere. Have you ever grieved the Holy Spirit? Has he prompted you to do something and you didn't do it? I have. I'm... I'm I've asked more and more that when he puts promptings in my heart, I will just stop and do it. Because I think I've told you all the time that I was driving. I was in a hurry because I was supposed to be somewhere teaching. And I saw somebody sitting on a bench in the cemetery out here on No Water Road, all alone, an older person. And it just came like an elephant on my chest. Go in there and encourage that person. And I'm like, I'm going to be late. You know, I'm going to do your work. You know, you know how those thoughts come in your mind. I didn't know the person. I thought, they're going to think I'm crazy. You know, but anyway, I left the stop sign, and I'm going right by the entrance, and it got stronger and stronger that I should go in there, and I went right on by. So you pray, and boy, I, I confessed that and grieved over it. If you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to prompt you, for his will in your life and to do things and you don't listen he may quit giving you promptings so be obedient to those he may say you need to write a note to somebody you need to call somebody all those kind of things they hardened their heart against what the spirit was telling them to do and they had a 40 year spiritual detour and they never got their inheritance. What does calloused mean? It's the result of repeated irritations. It's failing to respond to the Spirit's wooing. And the more that I let it go and let it go and don't do, my heart can get hard. He said, this is the end product of an evil heart. A hard heart. Because you're not sensitive to the Holy Spirit and what he's leading you to do. Now, the question is, it goes on, I believe we're about verse 18 now. With whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned? Their corpses fell in the wilderness. And to whom did he swear, you will not enter my rest, but to those that believe not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now, stop. What is the word in red? When I say unbelief, do you think of a lost person? We usually do, yeah. They don't believe. Okay, let's look at. I have a question for you. What was their unbelief about? They said, God cannot give me victory in the land. I don't believe God can give me victory over my enemies. I don't believe God is faithful to keep his promises. That's when they said the unbelief came in them. When they were standing ready to go in to enter and claim, and they said, I'm in unbelief now. I don't believe God can give us victory in there. Even though he promised, I don't believe it because of those giants. That's the first time it tells us that they were in unbelief. Now, 38 more wasted years because they refused to continue living by faith after they had been saved by faith or redeemed by faith and enter their inheritance. So there's a warning for you and me. Can I defect from living a life of faith and walking by faith. Yeah, they did in warning too, because they started drifting from what God had said, and they no longer believed that he would do what he said he would do. And the same thing can happen to you and me. So let's make a few observations here. 
the entire first generation except Joshua and Caleb were not allowed to possess the land of Canaan, their inheritance. However, God assured Moses their sin was forgiven. Whoa. Look at Numbers 14, 19. Pardon, this is Moses, I beseech you the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of your mercy. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Right? So he had forgiven them from Egypt till now. And that's where we are. And in Numbers 14, 20, the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Remember Moses interceded? He's a type of Jesus Christ interceding for you and me. But God went on to say, But truly as I live, all the earth is going to be filled with the glory of the Lord. And in verse 22, Because all these men, they saw my glory, they've seen the signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, but they keep testing me ten times. They have not heeded my voice when I've given them commands. Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. They had a grasshopper mentality. That was their mentality. And they no longer believed that God could do... They had seen the Red Sea parted. They had seen these wondrous works, but now he can't take care of the giants in the land. So, were there going to be consequences for their constant grumbling and rebellion? But God, because Moses interceded, said he pardoned them. Now, I want to proceed with caution here, and I don't want us jumping to any conclusions. Failure to enter the land, some people say, is the equivalent of they didn't go to heaven. Now, let's, we're just thinking. I'm trying to reason here. Canaan, first of all, is not heaven. We know that. It was their physical inheritance that they would be able to possess and experience victory over all of their enemies as they would continue to walk by faith. Everybody understand that and agree on that? Now, were there terrible consequences for their sin? Yes, but did God assure Moses that he pardoned the sin? He did, according to that scripture. Let's take it a little further with Moses. Moses, like the Israelites, it says, did not believe God and disobeyed his word. That's from Numbers 20, 12. It says... God spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you believed me not, you didn't sanctify me, lift me up in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. Let's keep on. Like the Israelites, Moses and Aaron were never allowed to enter the inheritance. The rest, it's called the rest, of possessing the inheritance, the land of Canaan. So we're still, we're proceeding with caution here. Surely we cannot conclude from Moses' failure to enter the rest or inheritance that Moses would not go to heaven when he died. Can we? We can't. Moses was at the transfiguration. Okay. Now. True believers are capable of having unbelief and disobedience. And I'm not saying they don't believe in God. This unbelief was about God's not able. That they, they had unbelief that God was able to do this. I want to move on to Exodus 13. It shall be a sign to you on your hand as a memorial between your eyes, the Lord's law, would be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. What is it? Passover. Passover. So Passover was supposed to do all these things. We're going to look at them. Passover was to represent your redemption has changed everything you do, everything you think, and everything you say. Passover re represents, it should represent a complete revolutionary change of your character and your conduct. How is my mind to be renewed? In the word of God, 
I am to be transformed and changed by being in this word. This is what will change me as I get into this word under the power of the Holy Spirit, and I will be transformed. Now, he made a command to the Israelites. These are the statutes and judgments which you shall observe to do where? In the land. See, when you slow down and read, those things jump out at you. You're going to do these in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers gives thee to what? You possess it all the days that you live upon the earth. So you're supposed to be in the land, possessing it all the days that you are on the earth. And there in the land, you're going to eat before the Lord your God. You're going to rejoice in all that you put your hand to. You and your households were in the Lord thy God hath blessed you. All your activity is to be bathed in delight and joy when you're in the land, in your abundant life, abiding in him. And then he says, you shall not do. So these are things you shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man's doing whatever's right in his own eyes. That's what they're doing out in the wilderness. I'm doing what's right in my own eyes in the wilderness. They had no sense of the sovereignty of God. A man in the wilderness, even though he's sincere. I can tell you that when I was down here for years, I was sincere. I thought I was doing everything God wanted me to do. I thought I was becoming spiritual because of all my activity. And I'm here every time the door is open. I'm playing the piano. I'm teaching. I'm doing all kinds of things. So you get into that habit. You know, I do all these things. I don't do this. That's a person living in the wilderness even though they're sincere. So the Christian activity and walk tend to be drudgery. I tell you, I got burned out. I got burned out. And it, rather than the sheer joy, I don't get burned out now. I don't. I just, I enjoy all of it. Even days like yesterday. <laughs> because when you see God working in your life, and he's using you to encourage people, to help people, and you're in the word, and it's just changing you, and you're getting to do what he has gifted you to do, it is sheer joy and delight. Now, you're to walk in the power and the fullness and energy of God in the Holy Spirit. Remember in chapter 12, verse 9, he said, you're not there yet. <laughs> you're still in the wilderness. You have not come to the rest and the inheritance which God is giving you. So while you're still doing the things you think are right, you're not in the rest. You're not in that abundant life. For he that has entered into his rest, that's the abundant life, he has also ceased from his own works. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> oh, because it's awful to struggle in the flesh. That rest here in that verse is the rest of Canaan, that inheritance, that milk of, uh, land of milk and honey. Now, here's what one of the commentators said. When you're in rest, you have relinquished the right to do what's right in your own eyes. You submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you recognize all of your activity now will stem from Jesus Christ and him living his life in you and through you. So he asked some questions, which I thought were kind of significant. What have you been doing since the day you were redeemed? Are you still doing what's right in your own eyes? Do you still claim the right to use your leisure time as you please? The right to spend your money as you please. The right where you choose to spend your vacation. You do not have that right unless you're living in the wilderness. Because they were doing what was right in their own eyes. Now, since I've been redeemed, I'm to be walking under the dictates of the Holy Spirit. Letting God direct me and lead my steps. Walking by faith. Partaking of Jesus Christ and his victory and all of that. He said, Passover is to be a memorial between your eyes. It's supposed to change everything you think. Everything you think about. Well, what were they thinking about out in the wilderness? In Numbers 11, the mixed multitude among them, they yielded to all this intense craving. So the children of Israel were weeping. And they said, who's going to give us some meat to eat? We remember the fish and the cucumbers and the melons and the garlic and all that. But now my soul is dried away. There's nothing at all out here besides this manna before our eyes. It says the manna was the taste as the taste of fresh oil. Now, 
in the Bible, oil is a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. That daily manna. It demonstrates when they see the manna, it demonstrates constantly and supernaturally the unrelenting presence of God in the midst of his redeemed people. What were they? I'm sick and tired of this manna, and I'm bored with it. This is an important thing that just jumped out at me. God never intended for them to eat manna for 40 years. He was going to give it to them 11 days. Now, when I enter the rest, that land of milk and honey, no, they are just dreaming about the good old life back in Egypt. That's all they were dreaming about. Now, had they been baptized with Moses, they were raised miraculously by God in a position to begin this new walk. He said, you're, you're geared for the journey. We're going on a journey. I'm taking you to this wonderful place, to the promised land. They were redeemed people brought out of Egypt. They're on their way to their inheritance. But their thoughts, ambitions, and appetites are being fed by the memory of which God had just redeemed them from. They are enslaved by their memories of what it was like in Egypt, right? So they were being dominated by a defeated enemy. God had already defeated all that. Now, what memories do we have of Canaan while I'm out in the wilderness? None. I haven't been there. They had no memory of Canaan yet. They heard sermons about it. I remember one of my friends used to say, Francine, you need to walk in the Spirit. And I'd say, okay, tell me how. She said, I don't know, but you need to walk in it. <laughs> I just, oh, I was looking for, the, it was like an elusive butterfly. I could not figure out how to walk in the spirit. I was trying very hard. Now, they only had secondhand talk about Canaan. I had heard some preachers and so forth, you need to live in that abundant life that Jesus gave us. But nobody ever told me how. That was my problem. They had no personal, vital, individual experience of Canaan. They knew the language. They could talk about it, but they had no life. They had never experienced it. Now, if I'm out in the wilderness, but I'm not walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, my life isn't surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and all of his promises and victories in the Bible, they're just going to be like ink on the paper. And irrelevant to me. I have nothing to celebrate while I'm out in the wilderness. Nothing. He said, it's also going to be in your mouth. Passover is in, you remember the day you were redeemed and the things you do, the things you think, and now what comes out of your mouth. He says, everything that you say. And what were they saying in the wilderness? Moses, you and Aaron, you take too much upon yourselves for all this congregation is holy. Every one of us. And the Lord is among us. Why do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? Their words coming out of their mouth were all holy. They resented every suggestion from Moses and Aaron that they were missing God's purpose for their life. On the ground, I'm holy enough. Now, I've got just a couple of things I want to tell us about manna. This was God's gift to a redeemed people, and it represents the gift of God's Holy Spirit and His presence. In Numbers 11, it says the manna was as the taste of fresh oil. And then in Exodus 16, it says it was the taste of wafers made with honey. It had a twofold taste to them out in the wilderness. Now, he said, the taste of fresh oil, it speaks of his witness to the presence of the living God in man's spirit after redemption. It's, the taste of honey speaks of his constant incentive to, to those in the wilderness, move on, keep going. You need to go possess the land and be filled with the spirit. The role played by the manna in the wilderness was not representative of the full gracious ministry that you and I have because he indwells us, right? He did not indwell them, but the spirit, the presence was there. And it was a foretaste of better things to come. It was, the manna wasn't just a thin, dry wafer, but it was going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And this gave him a foretaste of what it was going to be like, oil and honey. So there's just enough substance in this wafer to stimulate your salivary juices and make you cry for more. The first time that I knew that God's spirit had control of me and I kept my mouth shut, I tell you the peace that came over me and I said, this is it. This is what it means. I want more of it. I want him to control me so I don't struggle with all these things that I have 
defeated me in the past. The Holy Spirit reminded them there's a day to be remembered in the land when you possess it. Remember, he told them you will observe Passover and your day of redemption when you're in the land and possessing it. But now my soul is dried away. There's nothing here. The more they gathered the manna, the more they got sick of it. Remember, and they complained and complained. Our daily Bible reading is designed to allow the Holy Spirit to lead me into all truth so that I become increasingly a body wholly filled and flooded with God himself. This contains my wealth. It contains my heritage. And this gives me everything that I have in Jesus Christ. Now, if I don't respond to the Holy Spirit and the incentives he gives me, if I'm not enticed by the taste of the honey of this word, what happens? The wafer will remain stubbornly thin, dry, and uninteresting. If the Bible's dry to you, there's a problem. The daily manna was a source of discomfort to some, but it was a source of endless comfort to Caleb and Joshua. They never ceased to believe that the God who brought them out was the same God who would take them in. Imagine being Joshua and Caleb, and you're living among the wickedness and the idolatry and the grumbling and the unbelief of the Israelites. Did Joshua and Caleb, did they go out every morning waiting for the dawn to come, the sunrise? Did God leave the manna again? Is it still there? Because it represents God's presence is still there. And so at the first hint of daylight, they would scan the ground, and there it was, the manna from God. God didn't leave us. It was still his witness in the wilderness. Can you imagine while Moses was away that first time and Aaron yielded the pressure of the people, half naked in their shame, they worshiped that golden calf. What despair must have filled the hearts of the faithful few. Yet the next morning, mingled with all those shattered fragments of the tablets of stone which had been written upon with the finger of God, there it was, our daily manna on the ground. Symbolic of God's presence still with us. I thought of that old hymn, O oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. For in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Paul says, where sin abounded, grace abounded more. In Hebrews, he's going to tell us, God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. When every hope is dashed in our life, when every holy ambition written with the finger of God himself upon my heart is shattered, hope can rise again. Grace can chase away the gloom. There's still manna on the ground, no matter what. And in Haggai 2.5, he said, According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Fear not. While God was feeding his people in the wilderness, he let them hunger. He said, You remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee 40 years in the wilderness. Here's why he let them stay in the wilderness. To humble you, to prove you, so you would know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. And Moses goes on to say, he humbled you. Yes, he suffered you to hunger. He fed you with manna, which you didn't know what it was, and neither did your fathers. Why? So that he would make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. For 40 years, these people were never satisfied. The manna was given to sustain life, but not to satisfy. He never intended for people to be satisfied in the wilderness. And you will not change if you choose to live in the wilderness. The novelty of your activity and all of your service will eventually lead to major burnout in your life. You will ignore what you need, which is the fullness of Jesus Christ and the surrender to him. And you will begin to clamor for what you want. And be careful for what you ask for, because God may give it to you. And he says in Psalm 106, they soon forgot his works. They wouldn't wait for his counsel, but they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness. 
God tested them in the desert. He gave them their request. And he sent leanness into their soul. I think that picture on the screen is very indicative and il illustrates leanness in their soul. God refuses to satisfy you and I in the wilderness because he has a table spread with nothing but good things in Canaan in our abundant life. And next week we will pick up with the let us commands and his first one after telling us all of this in chapter 3 as we get into chapter 4 the command is enter the rest. Enter your abundant life and that's absolute Surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. And Lord, I thank you that uh, your mercy is beyond what we can even comprehend. Thank you for the love that will not let us go. And I pray that as we go through these lessons, we will be obedient to do what is necessary to enter that rest that we will look at next week because we desire more than anything to be obedient, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, and we want to finish well. And I just pray that that will become the desire of every lady that's in here. And I pray that we all will begin to get in your word and we will begin to see change in our life. Having victory over sin in our life and over our circumstances, over our fears. Because it's all there. We just need to partake of it. And I pray that we will be obedient. And pray that we will just lift up and exalt Jesus Christ. That his life will be manifested in us and through us to those around us. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. As you see, as you see, warning number two is going to have two parts because I didn't get to all of chap any of chapter four, but there was just so much good in chapter three that I wanted us to make sure that we uh, looked at. So uh, if y'all can handle more, I'll see you next week. Oh, be sure to vote for Laura, her book. Thank you.